So everyone, I'd like to introduce to you um, Evan Williams. And for some of the students here, I'm not sure if um, all of you are uh, aware of, of our commissioning um, program that we've had. And so this is our 55th year of, of our commission composer project at UW River Falls. And, and we're honored um, to commission composer Evan Williams to write a piece for our UWRF student body. And the UWRF, Professor Emeritus Conrad DeYoung, he began this commission project back in 1967, and his intention was to ensure that contemporary trends in American music would become part of uh, the repertoire of the students at UWRF. And throughout our project's history, we brought in Pulitzer Prize winners and Guggenheim and uh, MacArthur Genius Award winners, and we brought them usually onto campus to work with the entire um, student body. Obviously, this year is, is is unique because everything is, is remote. But um, also, as far as we know, it's the longest um, standing program of its kind in the United States. And so it places a national spotlight on the UW um, River Falls. And a little bit now about, about Evan. So this year, again, we're fortunate to welcome composer Evan Williams, who is an assistant professor of music at Rhodes College. Williams music has been performed across the country and internationally by members of the Detroit Symphony Orchestra, the International Contemporary Ensemble, Fifth House Ensemble, um, festivals such as Seamus, the New Music Gathering, Electroacoustic Barn Dance, and the New York City Electronic Music Festival. He has been commissioned by notable performers and ensembles, including the Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra, Urban Playground Chamber Orchestra, has received numerous awards and honors, including serving as the Detroit Symphony Orchestra's Classical Roots um, Composer in Residency in um, 19, or actually 2018. <laughs> um, um, Mr. Williams holds a, a DMA in composition from the College Conservatory of Music at the University of Cincinnati. He holds a master's degree in composition from Bowling Green State University and a bachelor's um, degree in theory and composition from Lawrence University. And before joining the faculty at Rhodes, he held teaching positions at Lawrence University, Bennington College, and Walden School's Young Musicians Program. So, all right. Well, thank you so much for that. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> so welcome, Elvin. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for that uh, wonderful introduction. Thank you for having me. It's really an honor to be a part of that lineage of composers. Uh, when Patty first asked me, uh, she listed some of the names and I was like, oh my goodness. <laughs> uh, so I was just honored to be uh, included in that in this tradition. So uh, I'm sure we'll talk more about the piece on Wednesday. Uh, so I probably won't get too much into the specific uh, uh, commission today. Uh, I'll, I want to present three of my works and then of course I want to leave plenty of time for questions uh, I know this is the composers seminar so there's I, I'm always happy to answer questions of you know about grad school career academia um, stuff like that um, so uh, happy to leave about 10 minutes at the end uh, for questions of those sorts uh, but to begin uh, I want to show you a wind ensemble work of mine uh, it's called Dodecatheon sketches uh, it is inspired by Greek mythology uh, one of my various interests in um, um, outside of music. Um, and uh, the Dodecatheon is uh, basically the Mount Olympus top 12. Uh, so there are a number of deities, um, you know, in Greek mythology, uh, but 12 of them were sort of the most worshipped and the most uh, admired of them. And so eventually I want to write... Um, multiple um, books of these. This is book one. Uh, and I want to have a sketch for each uh, of the deities. But so far, I only have book one, which includes Athena, Ares, and uh, Demeter. So today, I want to play the second two movements, uh, uh, Ares and Demeter. I apologize. My dog keeps running uh, yeah. back and forth. She's a little bit restless. And you might hear squeaking and stuff like that. Um, if she gets too restless, I'll, I'll put her in her crate. Uh, but uh, for now, I'll go ahead and share the score and the recording for this piece. I hope, um, let me know if you don't hear sound for any reason. Um, so one second, let's do a quick test. Great. Okay, excellent. So let me get that going. 
and then I'll get the score up. Sorry. Okay, let's try this again.
sorry about that. <laughs> that was sorry. the second movie. Right. Yeah, second and third movement. Sorry, uh, SoundCloud. It, SoundCloud just started playing something <laughs> that I have no idea what it was. Uh, so I apologize for that. Uh, so I decided to play that piece today um, because it um, the saxophones and percussion is are really important to um, this piece, especially those two movements. And um, my commission was uh, for saxophone and percussion. And so you can see how important these instruments have been to my life. Um, I've written a number of saxophone works and sax quartets, uh, not that many percussion works. Uh, the two I have written uh, haven't been performed, uh, but um, these instruments have both been really um, important to me as a composer, even though uh, I'm a trombonist uh, by training, I also sing. Um, and so um, both of these instruments were foreign to me when I started writing for them while I was at Lawrence. Uh, but both um, uh, saxophonists and percussionists always seem to be uh, gung-ho into new things, uh, willing to try new things, um, and always looking for uh, new music. And so uh, those instruments have been uh, become very important in my life. And so I just wanted to, I was thinking of what pieces that I have that um, really feature both of those instruments. Um, also, a lot in that piece, uh, even though it was written all the way back in 2013, uh, when I was a uh, master's student. Um, uh, so for me, it's a, I've uh, really sort of tried out a lot of different things since then, but uh, that piece uh, was an introduction to a lot of uh, things in my music that I still use. Um, so particularly aleatory, which uh, the piece that I have written for uh, you all includes aleatoric. And, all that means is just there's something that's left up to the performers. And so in the last movement, um, it uses offstage woodwinds uh, using bird calls. And these bird calls come from, are you uh, all familiar with the composer Olivier Messiaen? French composer of the 20th century. Uh, so he was uh, enamored with birds um, and in his uh, treatise on uh, birds, bird song. Wait, I always forget the order. Color. <laughs> bird song and I'm, I'm forgetting one orthonology colors you all know what i'm talking about if not look it up <laughs> and the title is actually in french uh, which i won't attempt to pronounce today um he documents a number of bird songs uh throughout the european region and um i all i did was basically stole them <laughs> and uh put them into the work and so uh the offstage players aren't restricted by any time. Uh, they just play the bird songs as they wish throughout that um, section um, and the or uh, the um, wind ensemble uh, follows. So um, that's, a, uh, that's a really fun part for me. And I always, I think the result of whoever, whenever it's been played twice, but it, both performances, they're really different and the results are always really beautiful. Um, also through there, um, I uh, my music is often um, very dissonant, uh, but also has moments of just complete tonality, and uh, you can hear that throughout, especially the second movement. Uh, but uh, a lot of experiment with colors, uh, which weren't wasn't really uh, a lot of what I was doing before 2013. But after 2013, I be just became fascinated with exploring timbre and colors and in instrumentation. Uh, percussion definitely helps a lot with that. Um, and I uh, just kind of went crazy. You can hear there's inspiration from Taiko uh, drums in the um, a second movement. In fact, when I was at Bowling Green, um, and if it, uh, I was hoping it was going to be played there, they actually had a Taiko ensemble, and we would have used real Taiko drums, but that wasn't a possibility. Um, so it was this performance is actually from Lawrence University. Um, uh, and when I went and conducted them. And so they're using substitutes, but the effect still works. Um, and then even in the third movement, which is really slow, uh, using percussion a lot, especially bell sounds, which uh, this, the piece that I wrote for you all in, incorporates a lot of uh, bell sounds um, um, uh, really um, resonate throughout that work. So uh, yeah, any questions? about that piece? Anything you, you saw that brought up questions? I thought the recording was fantastic. Uh, yeah. I actually was questioning if it was a uh, MIDI for a second because it was so like pristine. 
<laughs> oh no, it's it's real people, and it, and it's funny because um, I at the time I was a little bit disappointed by it, uh, especially especially the trumpets. They were just having an off day, and it requires really you know, like precise, um, you know, um, rhythms and whatnot. But uh, as as I've over the years, like I like oh they did really good for this really hard piece um, that you know they didn't have that much time uh, to prepare. So um, and it was a hard concert too on that concert. They also play A Child's Garden of Dreams by Mazlanka, my favorite piece, one of my favorite pieces. And so it was a, a, a tough concert. So uh, I'm, I, I really am really proud of the work they did. That was a really powerful, powerful piece. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think I just yeah. heard your dog. Uh, no, dog. I, 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 I thought it was a chair squeaking. Oh, OK. Yeah. <laughs> This. Yeah, Evan, I wanted to mention nothing to do with uh, uh, the music, but dogs. I have three chihuahuas, so, you know, they may they may join in if you're. Oh, OK, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, so my dog, Alma, she's a pandemic dog. Uh, so she's brought a lot of joy. Uh, I live alone. Um, and so she's brought a lot of joy and comfort during this time. But uh, she's very spoiled. <laughs> she's used to be like, uh, you know, I was um, I was actually um, in the fall on sabbatical. So not even teaching remotely. I was just here working on music all the time. So she uh, became used to me being always here, always near her. Uh, and now whenever I come and teach, she's like, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, <laughs> the, you're, you're talking to people who aren't me. So she gets a little restless. So you'll, probably... you'll have to, oh, sorry. You'll have to bring her to school with you now in the fall. Oh, she, I try to, <laughs> she's crazy. <laughs> she just, get, that's another problem with um, um, a dog during the pandemic is she's not really that well socialized. And so she's just like in public, she just goes insane. Um, so we're, we're working on it though. <laughs> I have a question for you, Evan. Um, mm -hmm. when, you, when you give instructions for aleatoric passages and, and sections, what, what wording do you use? I think that would be helpful for my class. To, yeah, to uh, so <laughs> it depends. <laughs> Yeah, it depends on the piece. Uh, for this one, I, it's, I use the box notation and it's in these like floating boxes. And so there's no like um, staves and there's no arrows or anything. And so for this one, I basically say that, and let me pull up the score again so you can see exactly what I'm talking about. <clears throat> so here, it starts right here. Um, so I basically give these big numbers and I stole this from John Adams. So uh, if you've ever, um, a few of his scores, especially harmonium, even though it's not aleatoric, just people have trouble counting it. <laughs> and so he, he suggests that the conductor puts up a one when we get here, like put up your one so everyone knows that everyone's in the same place. Uh, and I thought that was a great idea. And so the conductor, uh, in this case, me, uh, when we start the aleatory, I put up the number one. And that's great because there's people off stage. The, the, wind, the winds are off stage, so they have to know when to start playing. And then it doesn't really matter when they play this. You do see there are some cues, and uh, I say that these are optional off stage bird calls, and I don't want to make the piece too unapproachable. So if people can't manage four extra wind players uh, for their um, piece, they can... Um, uh, play these in the the cues in the ensemble and in that case they usually just decide to play them in time um which works out too and so uh they just play this on their own and the ensemble we just keep conducting um and i think it says uh which is like players should not continue on oh i'll i'll, I'll, I'll explain repeated numbers in a bit but offstage bird call should interact with each other as naturally as possible playing all gestures within the boxes in relative time to each other not in time with the ensemble. So what you don't see is there's a separate part for the offstage bird calls and then they're all together. All four instruments are in one score and they look basically just like this, but without the ensemble, um, it's just the, the bird calls. So they can see uh, their, the other parts. And so when they hear, I was like, okay, I've heard number one now, I'm number two, I'll play. Um, and then, uh, 
I forgot who I stole this from. It might have been Ludoslavsky. Um, but um, there's this repeated bar. And you repeat this bar basically until the bird calls clear. So some people might be still playing in this time. And that's okay. So I just give the repeat, repeat, repeat until there's no more bird calls. And then Q2. And that's when we move on. So that's how I worked it on this piece. But in other pieces, I do completely different things. Like um, sure. in the piece that um, I, I wrote in, in Sound and Alarm, it's it's basically goes by number of seconds. So it's a Sinza Mazura measure um, that should be played usually around 10 seconds. And um, I wasn't sure if this the piece was going to be conducted or not. And so just usually it could be a sac one of the saxophonists, you know, cue to say, okay, let's move on to the back to the strict time section or the conductor in this case, Patty uh, would, you know, let the players know we're done with the sins of Missouri bar. Let's go back to the regular metered bar. So. Very cool. Mm-hmm. Okay. A quiet bunch here. <laughs> we're, we're all just enamored by your music. So. <laughs> well, should we just move on to the next piece then? Yes, that'd be great. So the next piece um, is brought, brought me a bit of, um, perhaps I should, the word I should use is infamy. Um, so this is my uh, harpsichord concerto, Dead White Man music. I wrote it back in 2017. And when I first wrote it, um, I, you know, I, I was surprised that it wasn't as controversial as it is. Uh, it recently became more controversial because of this video that I will show you. Um, and I think it's just because people on this, uh, YouTube channel just like to stir up trouble. Um, I've been accused of um, um, white erasure or something like that. Uh, that is not the point of this piece. So um, when I was studying um, in my undergrad uh, at the Lawrence Conservatory of Music, uh, in my five years there, I never learned about the music of a composer of color. Never once did I play music by a composer of color, nor did I learn about any composers of color at all in five years. Um, I only uh, played two works by women. Uh, one was Libby Larson, uh, and I forgot the second one, uh, but only uh, never studied works by women in class. And when I went to grad school, that actually became a troubling point for me, that throughout all of my undergraduate career, career I had only studied the music of dead white European males. And so that made me start questioning, well, uh, is this something I should be doing? Uh, is this something that um, welcomes someone that looks like me uh, into this field? And so uh, this piece uh, is basically all about answering that question. Um, and throughout the piece, uh, it's not really any statement against uh, the music of the canon. It actually shows my deep love for the music of the canon, uh, but it also shows me um, um, my deep love for other music. So in the movement you're about to hear, and I wonder if people will guess the song, but in the movement you're about to hear, you he'll, you'll hear um, influences by jazz, you'll hear influence by Nina Simone, um, and you'll hear atonal influences uh, and all kinds of stuff in there. And so uh, basically it's, it's a very personal piece. Uh, it, it combines all of my passions as a composer. This second movement has sort of become um, a favorite of many. Um, uh, which I'm glad because it took a lot of hard work to write. It was not an easy movement to write. Uh, it's called Flow, uh, and in parentheses, My Tears. And it's based off the John Dowlin air, uh, Flow, My Tears, which you might or might know. And it basically treats that, um, that, um, that ballad as a uh, jazz tune. Um, and there's uh, so it states the head and there's jazz chords around it um, and then there's impro improvisation uh, and uh, and then it moves on to other sections um, and I was inspired to do this um, while I was at Lawrence um, Branford Marsalis came and gave a concert at Lawrence and it was a really great concert and I bought the album afterwards and in that concert and on that album Bragtown um, he plays Oh Solitude by Purcell uh, and basically plays it like a jazz tune. Um, and so I was really inspired by that. And so uh, that's the inspiration for this. So I'm going to start it. Um, hopefully I can find it right away. Uh, 
Uh, I don't want to. Let's just assume it. We'll start here and we'll listen to the end of the first movement and go into the second movement. Uh, so this is. Uh, I was very honored to be featured on Score Follower uh, three times. This is my third uh, feature on here. So we'll just follow the uh, video score through here.
thank you. So did uh, anyone uh, guess the Nina Simone tune I quoted? Did, no. did somebody say it? I thought I heard it in the class. Feeling good? Yeah, it was. Yeah, it's, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, I knew that. I couldn't place it, but yeah, that's now, yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, <laughs> yeah, I heard it. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly what, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, just stole the baseline. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Definitely one of my uh, favorite Nina Simone songs. Yeah. Oh, great, great one. Um, so, can you tell us why you chose the harpsichord as sort of your lead? Yeah, good question. So, uh, the idea of writing a harpsichord concerto came first. So I uh, always wanted to write a harpsichord concerto. Uh, it's funny because at first um, I hated the instrument. <laughs> um, I thought it was really dumb. I was like, there's no sustain. Uh, part of the hatred came from it because I was on setup crew while I was at Lawrence uh, as a student and the wind ensemble played this, this piece with harpsichord and Every, after each rehearsal, we had to move it across the music building um, and it had to be it had to be three people, two people holding oh. the instrument, another person holding the, the stand. I was like, what a dumb instrument. Why isn't it on wheels, <laughs> you know, like a piano? Um, and then I just thought I, I hated the sound and had no sustain and blah, blah, blah. But I, eventually um, I really got into Baroque music um, and actually was fell in love with the instrument. I, I don't know if there was a specific piece that did it, but I eventually fell in love uh, with the harpsichord and thought, you know, it would be really cool to write a harpsichord concerto, but a chamber harpsichord concerto, because obviously you can't, full orchestra would be hard with the harpsichord, but uh, this piece actually does use amplification for the harpsichord, um, which is possible for full orchestra too. Um, and that's so the idea was originally just a harpsichord concerto with chamber ensemble. Uh, but then I started thinking about this idea uh, of the canon and my relationship to it. And that's how uh, uh, they, these two ideas came together. But, um, you know, at first for a while, I was like, well, could this just be concerto for harpsichord? And, uh, and it could, but I think it's a different piece, um, um, you know, without, um, that title and without that backing behind it. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's uh, that's how it came about, the harpsichord. Yeah. And so like how, when, before you even start writing, like I guess I'm just wondering like, kind of how do you put like the first notes on the page or like kind of what's like your writing process as you go through? Sure. Now, I will tell you, I was a very bad composer for this piece. So normally my writing process is starts with perhaps something like this. Um, I get out my graph paper and I uh, map out the form. Um, and uh, I usually go like, you know, second by second of what the form is going to sound like. And I put all kinds of descriptions and notes to myself. And that's how I usually start a piece. And this is on uh, graph paper. So it helps me really organize my thoughts. And with my composition students, I encourage them to do the same thing, either on graph paper visually or writing out some kind of timeline. And then we move on to the manuscript book where we, you know, pull out, you know, uh, we do, you know, uh, harmonies, you know, work out harmonies, work out melodies, work out, um, you know, um, different variations of each pitch collections and stuff like that. I did none of that for this piece. I just started writing um, and it, it made it harder. <laughs> I, and I can see that now. Um, I, I wouldn't advise it. I, I, I probably should have done some what we call pre-composition work. Uh, but this one just, it just came out. Um, the first movement is a set of theme and variations um, on uh, the Bach. Well, it's uh, originally a Lutheran chorale, Esses Genunc, uh, very much inspired by Bach. Um, and I just wrote it out. Um, and then the third movement is a Toccata. And uh, I got stuck several times on it. This is one of the first pieces that I uh, was late on my deadline ended up turning it in uh, very late, um, uh, just about a month before rehearsal started. So I was glad that the conductor didn't, you know, kill me <laughs> for that. Um, and so, uh, yeah, um, but it, it worked out. I think the piece is, is really good. And I think, uh, I don't think that's, you know, 
the struggle necessarily helped it, but it, you know, turned out to be a good piece despite that. But normally my process is pretty rigorous. In fact, I can show you the form chart for the piece you'll hear on Wednesday. Uh, you know, it was very much worked out ahead of time. And this doesn't mean that I basically stick to this and don't do anything else. Um, I, you know, I allow for a lot of, um, you know, uh, changes and whatnot. In fact, throughout here, you might see something about um, uh, using the chorale, Ein Feste Burg ist unser Gott. That was an original idea, um, but I realized that made no sense at all for this piece and changed that to uh, the, um, the spiritual we shall overcome. Um, and so th that's uh, an example of being flexible um, even after this pre-composition work, so. And I just have one more question. Um, the third from the, the third measure from the end. Mm -hmm. uh, I was just curious about that. Is that just like sort of a moment of reflection, of pause? Like, what, can you, what would you say that it, that is? Oh, it's just all yeah, good question. Uh, um, I like really subdued endings um, uh, often. <laughs> um, and so I, so actually what's, what's interesting about this uh, movement is that you could say that it ends, you know, probably when you're listening, you probably think it ends, you know, four measures from the end, that that's the end. And I actually really, I told the conductor really milk that, like milk that fermata. And then there's another chord. Uh, but the second chord, I don't know if it's, it's hard to see it with the timeline. I don't think I can get rid of it. Hold on, let's see. There we go. Uh, that, you know, this bass pizzicato that was uh, important throughout most of the movement um, is, is here in the, the fourth measure, but in the last measure is just the quartet. Uh, and then they they uh, they fade away, and so um, there. I I didn't mean for it to be very philosophical. I just it's just dramatic. Yeah, <laughs> just yeah. Uh, but um, a subdued dramatic ending. Cool. So I have one more piece, but um, if we prefer to just ask questions for fifteen minutes, I can also do that. What, what do we think? The, the next piece is about eight minutes. We, do have, we some have a question. question. Yeah, let's ask more There's questions. A, yeah, sure. I, I, have, I have some students that have questions about sound and alarm. Sound and alarm. Oh, <laughs> well, perhaps should we hold those till Wednesday, though? Uh, what's the, I, Patty, what's the format for Wednesday? Yeah, that, that we're going to spend most of our time or how, however long Evan would like just talking about that piece and okay. maybe, you know, but Evan, one thing I, I was wondering is, um, when did you decide you wanted to be a composer? Mm. What, what um, I knew fairly early. Um, so I, when I was in like middle school band around sixth, seventh grade, I decided I wanted to write music, uh, but I thought I wanted to be a film composer and I wanted to write for film. Really the only reason I thought that, it, so neither of my parents are classically trained musicians, um, but they very much supported my interest in music. Uh, so I didn't know a lot about classical music uh, uh, before college. And I thought that the only composers who were alive were people writing music for grade school bands or in high school bands or film composers. And I didn't want to write, you know, educational band music, which it's funny that I do write a little bit now. Um, I wanted to write that film music because really the first uh, orchestral music I was exposed to was films. And uh, me and my father's favorite films are Star Wars. Um, so John Adams was a big influence on me when I was young uh, as a composer. And that's when I decided I wanted to, to write music, but I wanted to be a film composer. But um, eventually I, I really just, you know, um, really loved writing concert music and the one film project I worked on, I really hated the process. So I <laughs> uh, basically uh, just, I realized, oh, the director really has a strong idea of what they want, but they don't know how to do it. And I'm just basically the way to get them to do that. And I don't want to do that. I want my own creative control. And so concert music and multimedia, I do do some multimedia music that incorporates video. Um, so that's a way to, you know, do my own thing without having to answer to anyone else, so. Yeah, I noticed you had some uh, film film music mm -hmm. and are those those then earlier pieces? Uh, not all early. So the earliest one, I did a, 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 a quick 
promotional video for Lawrence, uh, which was cool. Uh, the the one that I the, was really uh, uh, it wasn't a terrible experience. I just didn't enjoy it that much. Uh, the the director was very nice. Uh, when I was in grad school, I did an animation project for someone's master's thesis, um, and um, uh, it's called a piece of afternoon uh, and that's that was really my first real uh, film composing um, and I also did the sound effects for her too uh, and um, yeah it, it was it's okay <laughs> uh, it's all MIDI there's no uh, real instruments playing in it um, so it's not it doesn't sound great but um, uh, she liked it and it worked out for her uh, purposes. Then I have done some silent films. So I did a score for um, Georges Mali's um, uh, The Impossible Voyage, uh, 1904, a uh, very famous silent film um, from 1904, uh, which I basically, um, I, I said, I'm gonna take this silent film and I'm gonna score it however I like. Um, and so that's what I did for that one. And I, that was a lot of fun. I did that uh, probably about three years ago, actually not too long before writing uh, Dead White Man music. It was in the same year. I definitely hear the John Williams in some of your music so far. Um, oh, really? Um, and like, and like in what? <laughs> A little melodic fragments that you do, like the rhythmic choices you make. Oh, okay. some little, um, which also reminds me of the New World Symphony, the, the third movement, you know, that opening it. You know, the little, mm. and I saw just like fragments of that. Like, so like I saw a little bit of that and I was actually going to say something, but I know some composers are, don't like to be compared to film composers because oftentimes they get, you know, like that's, that's another world and it's too, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. you know, no, I don't mind at all. I I love yeah. like it's funny. All my friends hate Hans Zimmer, but I love Hans Zimmer. I think yeah. especially like Interstellar. Like what a great score, um, and oh. just like the, the the textures that he gets out of the strings and organ. I love it. Um, Inception. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't mind at all. Uh, I've never thought about me like it's it's funny because uh, I've never thought about myself myself having inspiration from John Williams. Um, but yeah, that that, that that's interesting. It's also can be back into Borjak and you know the oh, late yeah. romantic yeah sure yeah definitely late romanticism uh yeah. there's definitely throughout this piece especially the first movement there's influence from brahms and sibelius and all that those folks so some of my favorite composers in that era mahler mahler's my favorite composer yeah <laughs> um have you ever had writer's block and also how then do you get out of that yeah uh, i have writer's block all the time <laughs> um uh, it happens all the time um in fact uh, immediately after writing this piece um, I didn't write a piece, an, uh, another piece for almost a year, uh, just because I couldn't. I, I think I put so much into this thing that the creative energy was spent after that. Um, and so uh, I basically, you know, I, I always, I always say things that like I'd never want my students to actually do. So I'm going to say this to you, but don't tell any of my composition students I told you this. If I have writer's block, I don't write. I just don't write. Um, because when I try to, anything that comes out um, is not going to be good. It's not going to be something that I'm proud of. Um, and so I just don't. Uh, if I if I can now sometimes I don't have that luxury because I have a commission and I signed a contract and I took money and I agreed on a, a date. In fact, I can I can tell you that I had writer's block writing sound on alarm on this piece. Um, and it, it, toward the end, I had no idea what to do. Um, I just thought it wasn't working. And eventually, I just did it. I was just like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. Um, if it, I hope it works. It's not the best possible solution that I can, uh, that I possibly could do. It's not, I know it's not the best work that I've ever done, but that's okay. Not every piece that I write has to be the best piece I've ever written. It can't be, uh, you know, uh, even, you know, the greats wrote some duds um, in their lifetime. I'm glad that Sound and Alarm, the sections that I thought weren't that strong when I heard the rehearsal recording, I was like, oh, that actually did work out. It worked out quite well. Um, and so um, uh, it, it worked out. But sometimes I listen to pieces like uh, the same uh, summer that I wrote Sound and Alarm, I wrote this um, this duo for mezzo soprano and violin. And I hate the piece. I think it's a terrible piece. And they love it. They, they keep 
performing it, but people asked me about it. I was like, no, that piece doesn't, won't exist anymore. The people who commission it, I let them, I'll let them keep playing it, but I'm not going to give it to anyone else because I don't think it's, it's very good work and I don't want it out there. So uh, there's two solutions. You either take a break um, and you wait until the creative juices come back or you just write through it. Um, and one way to write through it uh, is to know your tricks, your, your bag of tricks, your bag of tools. Um, some people don't like that, but um, because they think every piece has to be, you know, a revelation and you, you're, you're challenging yourself with every piece of music. Um, I don't feel like I have that luxury because um, I am not able to write during the semester. So I haven't written music since uh, last December because I'm not, uh, my teaching schedule just doesn't allow me to, to write music. I, uh, one thing you probably heard from my bio is that not only do I teach composition, but I also am the orchestra conductor here at Rhodes. And so it's just too much for me to also try to write music during the semester. So I only write music during the summer. Um, and luckily I was fortunate enough last fall to be on leave. So I was able to write music throughout that time. And so I have to be very, um, uh, and so usually in that time, since I hasn't, haven't been writing for several months, usually I'm just able to really go to work. Um, but, you know, even during that time, there's some some blocks. So if I really have to uh, get out something, I know things I do really well. I like I do things with, um, you know, uh, I do some stuff like this really well. Sorry. <laughs> You know, the, the minor third ostinato with the the low um, octaves in the left hand. I can do that all day and people love it. <laughs> I love it too. Um, and so it's like, okay, it's time to pull out the minor third ostinatos, you know. I also do like grooves and hockets really well. So like, uh, you know, people uh, playing these like sort of puzzle piece grooves together. Uh, I do that really well. So it's like, okay, time to write a, uh, a groove here. Um, um, so that's, that's what I do. It's like, okay, this is a trick that I've used before. I'm going to put it in here. Yeah. And that was a very long hockey. answer to your question. I apologize. Yeah. yeah the, on Sun Alarm, I noticed the hockey there between the break drum and the rest. I thought that was really, really clever. The mm -hmm. the that's the part that I, <laughs> that was the block. <laughs> and that was the solution to get past the block. <laughs> I think you have a, just a prolific way of writing. You, you're covering so many things, so many styles and genres, and uh, I just—it's just fascinating. You know, you, mixing jazz and aleatoric, and then you know, baroque music. It's just like it's such a nice color palette that you have. Thank it's you. Great. Yeah, I used to think it was a weakness, and I I had teachers. Some teachers tell me that it was a weakness that my voice was too. Um, Oh, wow. Now I forgot my words uh, that it was too sporadic and all over the place. Um, and, you know, perhaps at a time it was. And so I've, I've found a way to really integrate these voices into uh, my music. But just like, you know, there, I have so many inspirations. Like I listen to hip hop. I listen to rock. You know, I, I listen to early classical music. I listen to modern classical music. Um, and so I, I don't see a reason to limit myself um uh in my my style it's you know whatever uh the piece needs in this moment is what i'll use so if it needs a you know a, a groovy section that's what it needs if it needs slow baroque like sounds then that's what i'll do so i also noticed you're in the world of electronic music Yes. Mm -hmm. So ab about half of my output is uh, electronics and the other half is purely electric, uh, purely acoustic music. Um, usually these days um, I'm writing music for um, interactive electronics. So that means there's a person playing an instrument that their sound is processed by the computer. And um, that's a, a lot of my output. Uh, and I, I, I love it. It's great because that's another tool in the toolbox. So, uh, you know, if I want something that's like really sort of um, uh, techy and glitchy, then I'll, I'll put that in. Or one of my favorite things to do with, with electronics is have these long drawn out textures with um, uh, drones and um, uh, reverb and stuff like that. Um, and so, yeah, that's a, that's a really powerful part of my music. 
we may need to talk at some point. That's one of my loves. Is, yeah. <laughs> yeah I, <laughs> you know what? I, I have been talking to a friend of mine that I went to school with about possibly a percussion and electronics piece. So happy to include you in those conversations. Yeah. <laughs> yes. They need a little help with the commission. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Love to be I, I love consortium commissions because that just means lots of people to play the music. So I, and I love that. So. I probably have, I, I hate to, to end right at two, but I have an interview today. Um, so uh, but I could probably take one more question before heading off and then I'll see you all hopefully on Wednesday. Well, remember those sound alarm questions uh, for Wednesday. I'm, I'm happy to answer those questions. And I, I forgot who, who in the class played on it, but thanks to you two so much for your hard work. I know it's not an easy piece and uh, I was just listening to a bit of the recording and you do a great job. So I'm uh, so excited to share this with everyone on Wednesday. And thank you so much, Evan. And we look forward to meeting with you again on Wednesday and doing the, the premiere of yes, the yes. piece then. Thanks so much. It's an honor. Thank you so much. Take care. See you on Wednesday. Yes. Bye-bye.